What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, we are doing a show about sane medication policy and the ethics of pharmaceutical companies. Our guest is Robert Whitaker, and uh, Robert is a former journalist. He has eight years experience writing books. He was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and he's also won the George Polk Award, and he is the author of Mad in America, Bad Science, Bad Medicine, and the Endure. Mad in America was named by the American Library Association as one of the best history books of that year, and uh, Discovery Magazine called it one of the best science books for that year. Bob has recently written a number of books that are not on psychiatry, and he is currently working on a book that is on psychiatry from Crown that will be released in 2010. Uh, So thanks a lot for joining us on Madness Radio, Robert Whitaker. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, now we, I think you're actually one of the most popular guests because you have so much to say and there's really, really um, a lot to talk about on these topics. And so it's great to have you um, back on the show. And I would um, point um, listeners to our archives and if they want to get um, a little more, little bit more deeply into your work and talking about Madden America, they can listen to some of the previous um, shows. Now, tell us a little bit about um, your history of research around mental health and pharmaceutical companies and the treatment of people who are diagnosed with mental illness and sort of what what the background is where do you think we are as a society with how we respond to people who are in crisis and who end up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar or any of the other uh, severe mental illnesses yeah I I really got into this field in 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 through a through a back door and it was really there were two ways I got interested in writing about mental health and our country's policy towards those who are diagnosed. One, after I was a daily newspaper reporter for a long time, but then after I I stopped being a daily newspaper reporter in the mid-90s, I I co-founded a publishing company called CenterWatch that focused on the pharmaceutical industry. and We reported on clinical trials and the business aspects of clinical trials. And there I saw the way that how, how money affected how drugs were tested, how those results were reported, sort of the corruption of the academic uh, medical establishment by that pharmaceutical money. And that was broad-based. That wasn't just related to psychiatry. But that's where I really learned a lot about how that complex, the pharmaceutical complex and the academic medical complex, sort of worked hand-in-hand, or how one uh, sort of influenced the other. Um, but during that time, this was from like 1994 to 1998, I kept writing for newspapers and magazines on a, on a freelance basis, even as I had uh, my company. And I eventually went to the Boston Globe, who I'd written for before, to do a series on uh, abuse of patients in psychiatric research settings. And that this was going to be a fairly straightforward um, you know, story. And it was while I was doing that study, I came upon outcome studies that showed that schizophrenia patients in poor countries of the world, and this was done by the World Health Organization, and they did the study twice, fared much, much better in the poor countries of the world than in the rich countries of the world. And the World Health Organization actually concluded that living in a rich country of the world was, quote, a strong predictor that you would never fully recover. And I really then wrote Madden America and got in, in, involved in this whole uh, you know, field to try to figure out why did schizophrenia patients fare so poorly in the United States and in you know, European countries. So, and, and, those world health, and then those studies actually just led me into this, this, this larger field, this larger question uh, of you know, how do we treat uh, people in this country who are diagnosed with severe mental illnesses. And... Um, you know, that's a, that takes you down a, an incredible path, uh, an extraordinary path where nothing is as you thought it was when you are on the outside of that mental health world. What were some of the things that you discovered and kind of where are we now as a society in terms of mental health treatments? Right. I think that those are, those are related. I mean, in terms of what I discovered is that 
and I'm speaking in, in with a broad brush here, but that the story we had believed in as a country, the story I had written about as a reporter, and that story is that we were getting ever better at understanding the biological bases of, of different psychiatric disorders, and our drugs were getting ever better at treating those biological problems, ever more effective. That whole story is false. It just, you know, in fact, researchers haven't been able to uh, discover the biological causes of, of mental disorders. That's number one. And two, there's no evidence that, uh, quote, the second generation of psychiatric drugs are really any better than the first generation of psychiatric drugs. And three, there is no good evidence that outcomes are getting better. In other words, during this whole era of the psychopharmacological revolution, you don't see mental illness becoming less of a problem. You don't see, uh, you know, outcomes, long-term outcomes actually for schizophrenia getting better. In fact, in 1994, uh, Harvard researchers reported that outcomes were getting worse. And it's the same thing with bipolar. Bipolar outcomes are markedly worse than they were, you know, 30 years ago. So, so if the medications were actually helping, we would see something like with the introduction of penicillin, where the diseases that it treated actually went down dramatically, whereas you're saying when the drugs were introduced for treating schizophrenia and bipolar, the results weren't evident. In fact, the situation got worse. Yes. I mean, in any sort of big picture way, if you have effective treatments for a physical disease, the morbidity, as they say, and the mortality from that disease should abate somewhat, right? You should see people living longer, you should see people more enabled by those treatments. You should see the symptoms be becoming less pronounced, all of those sort of uh, improvements in, in, in outcomes. We do not see that with, um, if you go back and look at what was the, the spectrum of schizophrenia outcomes, say, from 1945 to 1954, just before um, the, the Thorazine was introduced, you see a very surprising picture. It, what would the like? What what what? How much of a problem was bipolar disorder in 1965 before lithium became popularized? Well, a it was quite rare. There were very few people suffering from it, and b those who did had generally pretty good long-term outcomes. Now it's a much worse course, a much more chronic illness. Same thing with depression. Depression didn't used to be such a disabling disease. So what we see now in this era of the psychopharmacological revolution, we see more people being disabled by mental illness, an astonishing increase in the number of people disabled by mental illness. We see people um, suffering from all sorts of physical problems that didn't used to characterize mental disorders. We see people dying 25 years earlier. We don't see, we don't see nearly the employment rates we used to see. So what we see during this last 50 years, since the arrival of Thorazine, during this era of the, quote, psychopharmacological revolution, we see outcomes for disorder after disorder getting worse. People are more chronically ill. We see they have physical problems. We see their employment ratings, rates dropping. We see early death. In other words, we do not see all of the signs in the scientific literature that tell of effective treatments for known diseases. It's just not there. Instead, what we see, and this is, goes back to your question of what I found and what is sort of became so gripping to me, is we see precisely the opposite. We see a tale, if you really dig into the scientific literature, that goes like this. We see a tale in which um, research has not been able to identify the biological causes of any mental disorder. That's number A. And B, we see drugs, if you actually look in, in the research in terms of how they work, that sort of perturb otherwise normal function. And C, we see poor long-term outcomes again and again and again. And, and bottom line is, it's a failed paradigm of care. And the, my new book, in essence, is, that I'm working on now looks at that. And here's just one example of the data you can pull up. In, in, in 1955, at the beginning of this revolution, there were about 570,000 people in state mental hospitals. But what we don't realize is many of those people were uh, Alzheimer's patients. They were basically serving as nursing homes. And they were also people ill with end-stage dementia from syphilis. The number of people with mental disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, et cetera, was only about 360,000. 
by 1987, and I picked 1987 because that's sort of the beginning of the second generation of psychiatric drugs, but anyway, by 1987, we had something like 1.3 million people on SSI or SSDI because they were disabled by mental illness. And from 1987 to 2006, the number of people receiving SSI or SSDI because of a mental illness, and this is between the ages of 18 and 65, grew to something like 3.75 million people. So it tripled. Exactly the opposite you should be getting. And as you know, well, we've been medicating kids now in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Here's what's happened to the disability rates for kids who uh, now can receive SSI if they're severely disabled by mental illness. In 1987, there were 18,000 such kids in the United States. Today, it's 600,000 such kids. The number is increasing by 100,000 kids per year. That's people 0 to 18 years old. And one other thing is, you are now seeing, if you look at the SSI and SSDI data, a whole new group of people appearing on it. And that is young kids, by this I mean kids, uh, young adults, 18 to 25, showing up in great numbers, said to be disabled by bipolar illness or depression. They never used to be in the mental hospitals, that group of uh, patients. They, uh, 20 years ago, they weren't showing up on the SSI and SSDI data. So suddenly, in this era when we began medicating kids left and right, we now have a new group of disabled people, young kids, age 18, 19, going right to, SSS, uh, right to SSI and SSDI. And you know what psychiatry says? Psychiatry says to those kids, and I'm sorry I'm using kids, but you know what I mean, young adults, you're going to be disabled for life. You're going to be chronically ill. I mean, it's just that those are all facts that tell of an absolute failed paradigm of care. So you're saying that not only are people who are suffering actually getting any help from the basic treatments that are offered, but the treatments that are offered, which is primarily medication, is actually making the situation worse. Yes, and what I'm talking about is in the aggregate, of course, because I know what's going to happen. People are going to call and say, well, I need my drugs, my drugs helped me. And, and it's absolutely true, a couple of things are true. If you look again at the scientific literature, there is clearly some evidence that some of the drugs alleviate uh, you know, symptoms that can be really problematic for people over the short term. That's true. Okay, and people perceive that. They're in a crisis or whatever, and maybe they're, you know, quite depressed, et cetera, and they get put on an antidepressant, and the, and the depression, you know, lifts. There are people who, you know, in manic episodes that will get treated with a drug that will help break that manic episode. So that's true. Now, there's a second delusion, that, though, that, and there's a second problem that comes in. It's really sort of a delusional thing in the sense that, a perceptual delusion. So you go on drugs, right? The drugs change you, and then you try to go off the drugs, and you often do relapse. But that relapse rate is greatly exacerbated, you know, increased by the fact that the drugs have changed your brain. And that's one of the things that's hard to, to grapple with. And then finally, and this is what you just asked, do we see a um, people in the aggregate becoming more chronically ill than if they were never treated with the medications? Answer, yes. And second, do we see people who are mildly ill, let's say you have a, a depression of some sort, then moving on to a worse illness, a worse category, say from depression to bipolar? Yes. And this actually is what's helping to fuel this bipolar boom. And that is, is if you use antidepressants with a, a great number of people, a certain percentage of those patients, are going to have a sort of a psychotic or manic episode in response to the drug. Then they get diagnosed as bipolar, put on maybe lithium or a cocktail, and now they're really onto a path of chronic illness. So if you, if you want to summarize the scientific literature is there's some evidence for short-term efficacy. There's also evidence that once you're on the drugs, you're at pretty high risk of relapsing when you try to come off, especially if you do so abruptly. But three... The evidence is quite clear that over the long term, having been exposed to drugs and being put on these drugs increases the likelihood that you'll become chronically ill or ill with new and more severe symptoms. And that's what the story that is writ in the scientific literature, and it's consistent, and it, 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 you can find it from the moment 
we start this basically, the first long-term studies in the 1960s, and it carries forward until today. It's an absolutely consistent picture. So again, this is not a um, this is not any kind of argument to be completely blanket anti medications for everybody or any kind of judgment of anybody who's taking medications and finding them helpful. Because I certainly know plenty of people who um, feel very helped by their medications. This is really looking at the hard science and the long term outcome of what, on the whole, these treatments are doing when they become the basic standard for treatment in our society and the implications that people often don't realize when they get on the medications because they aren't really told the full picture about what the risks are with the medications. In a way, what I'm talking about is, A, societal perceptions. By, you know, how, can, how is it working for us as a society as a whole? Well, it's not because you're getting all this, you know, these increase in disa- people disabled, right? And that's not what we as a society want. And then all you can say for the individual, you know, there are, there are clearly a spectrum of outcomes of people exposed to the meds. And all you can say as the science does is it increases the likelihood from that moment of first exposure that you'll become chronically ill or ill with new symptoms. But it doesn't mean that you might not also fall into you know, a good outcomes category. And real quickly, there's a, you know, there was a, this study done by Canada that's really fascinating that sort of points this duality out. And what happens there, at least at this time, is let's say you missed work 10 days in a row because you were depressed. Well, apparently, at least at this time, they had some sort of short-term disability that you went on. So what, and, and as you know, they have a national health service there, so then they, they did this study where they looked all, at all the people who went on disability, short-term disability for depression. And then they looked at what percentage of those patients went on to long-term disability. And then they divided them into two groups, those who took drugs and those who never filled a prescription for antidepressants. Now what they found was, and if I can remember this right, is that something like 82% of the drug-treated patients eventually went back to work. Okay, it, which seems for that group that the drugs worked, right? They got better enough to go back to work. That seems pretty, pretty high response. Well, what was the percentage of people who didn't take any drugs that went back to work? Well, I think it was 91%, if I remember this correctly. In other words, from society's point of view, the, the exposure to drugs uh, doubled the risk that a person would become disabled. Yet many people who took drugs will certainly see themselves as having been helped. And that's sort of the nuances sometimes of the scientific literature, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's absolutely a complicated issue, and it doesn't lend well to sound bites. That's one of the reasons that your work is so important, because you've dug into the studies, and you've taken a really careful look at the science itself. Um, Bob, tell us about um, the current situation, because there have been a number of scandals in the media that people have heard about, and what your sense of, you mentioned the, the corruption of the academic establishment and the pharmaceutical company's influence, the corruption of the science that's really driving the whole situation and that got us into the place that we're in right now. What you really need is to be in a society where those who do the research um, are going to do honest research and are going to report the results honestly. In other words, so they do not have a bias. And then if you can do that, you can get information that allows people to make informed decisions. In other words, patients to make informed decisions, uh, doctors to make informed decisions, and you can weigh the benefits and risks, right? Um, And if we had that, I I honestly believe that drugs could be used as tools in sort of thoughtful ways. But what happened is, is that, in essence, the pharmaceutical industry, and this is particularly true um, in psychiatry has basically bought all the top psychiatrists. And by that I mean is all the top psychiatrists are acting as consultants to the pharmaceutical companies. They sit on advisory boards. They get research grants, that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, I, I went to the American Psychiatric Association um, annual meeting this past spring that was held in Washington, D.C., and the APA actually did a pretty nice job of saying how each of its speakers, you know, what, were, what was each of its speakers' relationship to pharmaceutical companies. And what would you would find is they would have, be receiving money time and time again from like five, six, seven pharmaceutical companies. 
And it wouldn't just be that they were getting research grants. They were on advisory boards. They were consultants, which meant they were committed. And these are the top guys at top academic schools. They are committed to telling a story to the public of how these drugs work and are good for you because they're not going to be advisors and they're not going to be consultants and they're not going to be getting research grants if they're telling the public, oh Christ, it looks like we're doing long-term harm with these drugs. And it was really fascinating, say at the APA meeting, and then we can talk about some individuals in a second. So up front it was all like, oh man, these drugs are so great. And you know, there were, meet, there were press conferences for reporters and we're making progress treating de- depression and we got these new new thoughts about bipolar, and then you went to the big luncheon that was sponsored by one of the drug companies, and it said for juvenile bipolar, for example, you should be using a mood stabilizer and a neuroleptic, and if the first neuroleptic didn't work, throw in a second neuroleptic, and maybe you can use an antidepressant, right? So use drug cocktails, and that was the front story. Then meanwhile, you go into sort of the back rooms of the APA and you've got somebody doing a long-term outcome study on bipolar and he's saying, you know which group does best? Those off meds. You know which group did second best? Lithium only. Do you know which group did the worst? Those on drug cocktails, the very thing that's being promoted by the guys taking the consulting fees from the pharmaceutical companies. And that's where you see the corruption. And, and, and I'll give you another example. Um, again, this guy named Martin Harrell does this long-term outcome studies for schizophrenia. What does he find? 40% of those off drugs are recovered at 15 years. How many on drugs? 5%. Recovery rate is eightfold higher. Now, did, did the American Psychiatric Association announce that result? Did they, say, did they put out a press release so that the New York Times put it on their science page so that the Associated Press did? Absolutely not. They didn't put it on at all. That news didn't get out. It didn't appear in any American newspaper. And you can be darn sure that if the results were the opposite, that recovery rates were 40% for those on drugs and 5% for those off drugs, and recovery meant asymptomatic, working, et cetera, um, uh, and not hospitalized in the previous year, we would have heard about that everywhere in the newspapers because that would have been a confirmation of the story. And that's what I mean about the problem with the corruption. It's not just that pharmaceutical companies pay guys at, say, Johns Hopkins or Harvard or wherever it be to design trials that then make their drugs look good. I mean, that's bad enough, and they do do that. But in addition, we don't even, the public doesn't even get told the real study results. But the study results that tell a, a, a sort of long-term harm, they are absolutely covered up, buried, and not told to the public. Um, that's really the corruption of the money. Now, a couple of examples. Um, Fred Goodwin is a former director of the NIMH, and he's well known because he did the M- NPR's Infinite Mind series, I think is what it's uh, talked about. And on those Infinite Mind series, he would you know, basically promote the conventional wisdom. We're making progress. These drugs are essential, etc. Now, two things. What recently came out is he gets drug money. So, of course, he has to say that on NPR. Now, the other interesting thing is, at the APA meeting, he was at a session where the physicians were talking about how antidepressants had worsened the long-term course of bipolar illness. So away from the public, here's a guy among his colleagues who's saying, oh, Christ, this, this class of drugs is worsening the long-term course of, of, of bipolar. But publicly, when he's on NPR and he's getting money from drug companies, he's telling an only positive story, and that's a problem. So he ends up being a marketing gatekeeper, basically censoring important information about the realities of medical treatment in the U.S. Exactly. All in the name of doing an NPR show that's all about helping people with mental illness. So see how the public's being misled? If you go to a used car lot, right, or a car thing, and a salesman comes out, you know he's a salesman, right? You know he's going to try to sell you something. But what happens with the way the public gets its information about psychiatric drugs, they get it from academic guys, the guys that have titles like they work at Stanford or Johns Hopkins or Harvard or wherever it might be, former director of the NIMH, and you think you're getting the expert, the neutral expert. Well, in truth, you're getting guys that have signed marketing contracts with, with the pharma companies. That is, in essence, the bottom line truth, and that's the problem. Tell us a little bit about what happened to Goodwin, because didn't he get exposed and then he was fired from NPR, right? 
Well, he did. Now, the irony of this is, I, I, yes, he did get fired. And NPR said, oh, my goodness, we didn't know he was take, getting money. Well, I have to say, I can't imagine how NPR didn't know this. I mean, I knew it, and I, it wasn't like I was trying to find this out. Um, so, I mean, it, it was easy to find out. So, I, I don't know whether NPR was just embarrassed by the revelations or they truly didn't know. I, I mean, I, I'm surprised they thought that Goodwin, you know, was a virgin in this territory. I mean, it, it would have taken about two minutes to understand that he wasn't. There, there are virtually no virgins left in psychiatry. They are almost all on, you know, advisory boards, consultants, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a few, but there aren't many. And so the story with Biederman of uh, Massachusetts General Hospital? This is just horrible, in my opinion. <laughs> so let's go back a few years. If you go back to the 1970s, 1980s, there was hardly anything such. There was people debated whether any a kid could even get juvenile bipolar disorder. Okay, whether it existed. So you might see kids having temper tantrums or acting out as, you know, behaving badly. But and and so that's how you know it just wasn't seen as a as a, as a mental disorder. Well, Biederman became the guy that promoted the idea that certain kids did, in fact, in fact, a fair number of kids had juvenile bipolar disorder. And I think it's in 1995 he publishes a paper that, that helps establish this as a valid uh, diagnosis. Well, what we see then in documents that have since surfaced in, um, in, in a lawsuit is that Biederman was going to Janssen, for example, the maker of Risperdone, which is one of the uh, you know, new atypicals, and he was saying to them, you give me money of a certain amount, and a, and a fair amount, and what I promise to do is I promise to uh, validate this diagnosis, and I promise to produce data that makes your drug looks good. So he literally was doing a quid pro quo saying, fund me, and I will further your business interests. And he even there was even an element of extortion there in the letters he was sending to them or the emails saying that if you don't do it, I'll go to one of the other drug companies that 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 uh, make an atypical um, antipsychotic. So just to, let's let's put this in a moral context, okay? He is going to say he's going to diagnose kids, some five, six years old, with a disorder that never used to be diagnosed. And he's going to help get those kids on neuroleptics, antipsychotic drugs. And what do we know about those drugs? Well, we know they enlarge the basal ganglia, which is associated with an increased vulnerability to psychosis. We know that they, they, they often damage the basal ganglia, and that results in something called tardive dyskinesia, which is a form of permanent motor dysfunction. We also know that the drugs, um, the anti antipsychotics, shrink the frontal lobes, and that shrinkage is co correlates with um, a, a um, cognitive decrease in function. So we see that decline as well. So that's the moral dimension. You have a doctor at one of the top, um, you know, uh, medical facilities in the country, MGH, Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital saying to a drug company, I'll validate this dose diagnosis, we'll get more kids so diagnosed, we'll get more kids placed on the drugs, all you have to do is give me your money. And as he's doing that, we have data showing dysfunction in the basal ganglia over time. Uh, I mean, we're talking about permanent dysfunction, dysfunction in the limbic system, which is the area that you do um, emotional responses to the world frontal lobe dysfunction over the over time and we're talking five ten years but theoretically these kids are going to be on these drugs forever so i mean i should ask you will what how do you uh, you know morally judge such an action i know how i judge it it's not what a doctor is supposed to be doing if you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. We're speaking with Pulitzer finalist and George Polk Award winner Robert Whitaker. He's the author of Mad in America, Bad Science, Bad Medicine, and the Enduring Mistreatment of the Mentally Ill. And we're speaking about sane medication policy. It's not what a doctor is supposed to be doing. And it's, I think it's clearly, 
it's some kind of society-wide trance or big lie that everyone just gets so on board with it that it's it's like too much of a risk for people to start believing anything else. They just travel with the herd, and the the consequences of that kind of groupthink are devastating. And then you add in the the profit motive of, that's driving it, and um, I mean, kids are are dying as a result of this. If this was in a in the context of a different um, medical um, disease other than mental illness, I think there would probably be a much bigger um, a much bigger outcry about it because, for example, the number of people who um, died as a result of the Vioxx scandal was actually very small compared right. to the number of people who have died or will die because of the Zyprexa scandal and the number of kids that we're talking about. I mean, these are the number of prescriptions is much, much higher um, in terms of the, the negative outcomes. So there is kind of a moral double standard at work here for sure. Uh, and the other thing that's significant, I think, about the Biederman case is that this is not just some guy who's a random psychiatrist who was caught, um, you know, doing something corrupt. This is one of the most prestigious psychiatrists in the world at one of the most prestigious um, uh, facilities in the world who is leading, single-handedly leading a dramatic change in how the whole society is being treated around mental illness. He was primarily responsible for getting all those kids a bipolar diagnosis and getting them on drugs. So what kinds of consequences is he suffering then? None. So they're not really going after him after all. <laughs> he brings in a lot of money. He hasn't lost his job. I don't know. I don't know if anything's going to happen. I mean, there's some Harvard students that are questioning why he's still there, but he hasn't lost anything. Has he lost any kind of position or anything? Or? No. Wow. Suffered no consequences. Wow. That's pretty outrageous morally. The, the diagnosis of bipolar increased something like 40-fold, uh, juvenile bipolar, after uh, Biederman published his 1995 paper. So we're talking about many, 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 many kids now wrapped up in that diagnosis. And by the way, and again, in terms of death, um, you put kids on a lanzapine or Zyprexa, no one knows how long they can expect to live, but what we do know is they're not, if, if they keep taking antipsychotics continually, they're going to have shortened lives. That's for, that's for certain. Uh, the consequences for Biederman, there have been no consequences. I mean, he's been sort of publicly shamed and revealed as, um, you know, a, a, a greedy physician uh, who put his own interests above science and presumably the kids. But he's still an MGH, and, and he hasn't been, you know, formally disciplined by by Harvard. Um, so I'm not sure if it's going to hurt his career at all. I mean, that, that that's the. So Bob, given the failure of the mainstream treatments and the the clear indications in the research that the treatments are a failure, and given the extent of the corruption. Um, in the mental health industry and the influence that the pharmaceutical companies have. Um, what do you think, and I'm asking this in part because of the recent presidential election, and there's a lot of optimism about change in the, in the society and in the politics, but if you could sort of design a sane medication policy and a, a sane regulatory policy and, and something that really made sense in terms of treating people, um, on a policy-wide level for the society as a whole, what, what would it look like? What do we really need to do as a society to really meet the needs of people who are having behavioral problems or emotional distress or having wild psychotic states or going in, into crisis? How can we really serve people's needs? Well, the first thing we can really do to serve people's needs is to reconceive of those problems and those disturbances and reconceive of them in line with what the literature shows, and that is that there's every hope people can recover from such descents into madness, descents into mania, descents into bad depression, etc. Now, is everybody that starts hearing voices uh, going to do well long term? No. Is everybody who descends into a very deep depression uh, going to do well long term? No. But what you see is that there's every hope uh, that many, many, many people will, can, 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 in essence, have an episode of mental illness and recover. So the first thing we should do as a society is understand that, reconceive of the disorders in that way, because we, you know, instead of thinking of them as biological fate, so to speak, 
And if we reconceive of them that way, then we should think, okay, when you have people in that sort of extreme stress, extreme distress, well, what can we do to help them through the episode, so to speak, and help them sort of recover to where they were before? And the minute you do that, you start talking about, well, what do you do for people who are descending into psychosis? Well, you probably need some shelters, some safe houses, right? Um, the literature is quite clear that you should try not to put people sort of with the first episode of psychosis on drugs. You should try to get them through the episode without exposing them to neuroleptics. But you need something, right? You need safe houses. You need shelters. You need places where people in those extreme states can be and, and, and so society won't find them threatening. So you need that. Depression, what would you do with depression? Well, you would understand that the best outcomes from, come from like uh, sort of rigorous ag- exercise programs. So you would set up some sort of health care insurance reimbursement system that acknowledge that, that in paid instead of money for you know, your, your, your antidepressant every day, paid for you to go to a, uh, an exercise workout and, and, and that would become your prescription, so to speak. So we would try to set up, that's really, I think, what we need to do as a country, as a society, is if we could reconceive of mental disorders as often temporary setbacks, et cetera, and that people have every hope of recovering from them. And I'm including, you know, sort of serious, uh, you know, the more serious symptoms of psychosis, et cetera, and then develop programs to, at least in the beginning, people newly happening with that, um, to get them through that episode and hold out the hope not of disability, hold out the goal uh, not of being on SSI or SSDI, but to hold out the goal of being, you know, uh, functional like everybody else, getting married or having kids, having jobs, that whole story. One of the things that I've really noticed is the connection between a sleep deprivation and crisis, that just focusing more on, look, you know, the person who is in a crisis is going through a tremendous amount of stress, and if we can just get them to rest and get some sleep, that can really, for a lot of people, interrupt the crisis and get them to come through it and come back rather than getting them immediately on medication and then they're on this long-term a trip that may have no end of seeing themselves as, as a mental patient. You know, Will, that's really interesting. I mean, if you go back to the early 1900s, uh, there's a lot of doctors, psychiatrists, who say the first thing you have to do to see what you're dealing with is restore a normal sleep-wake cycle. Because so many times, if you can restore the sleep-wake cycle, things that, you know, the symptoms disappear. And anybody, everybody, if they start having, let's say, let's say tonight I don't, I stop sleeping for the next four days. I will be psychotic by the fourth day. It's guaranteed. It will happen. Yeah, that's so, one of the things that really shows that this is a continuum of experience. It's not there are the crazy people with the broken brains, and then the rest of us, anyone can really go psychotic under the wrong circumstances, uh, uh, especially absolutely. like uh, sleep deprivation. Absolutely, that's that's the first one. You know, another thing that that clearly needs to be recognized is. Go, go do a survey of 100 people with a diagnosis of, say, schizoaffective disorder or bipolar disorder and find out how many of them, before that happened, were doing a lot of marijuana or hallucinogens, et cetera. And this isn't, you know, the old, like, um, you know, anti-drug spiel of that sort. But it is true that you see that those drugs, and especially people who really start hammering them down, that can be a gateway to psychosis or mania, et cetera. It's really true, and part of the problem is that so many people you know, take mushrooms or hallucinogens or smoke pot and don't have a problem that we don't expect that someone might come along who is sensitive or vulnerable. I mean, I, I know that I've had problems with marijuana. I, I cannot smoke pot at all. It gets me really, really out there. But I know people who have a severe mental illness diagnosis. They're taking their medications, and they're also smoking marijuana, and they kind of wonder why they're not actually getting their feet back on the ground, and maybe the pot is something that should be focused on. And this is not a, um, you know, an anti-marijuana diatribe because I know people who are really helped by cannabis, and we actually did a show on medical marijuana, which can be helpful for some people. But just to recognize that if someone smokes is smoking pot, they go into a psychotic episode, then hey, just getting them off the marijuana for a while, getting their sleep restored, that might be all it needs to get the person back on their feet again.
Exactly. That's my point. So if if you have people who have a psychotic or manic episode following regular, or, you know, some ingestion exposure to marijuana, cocaine, hallucinogens, mushrooms, etc., what you first want to do to see is if you can clear that out, right, and as you say, restore sleep-wake cycles. It doesn't, you know, it, it can very well be a, a, a reaction brought on from those drugs, and that makes perfect sense. So, but I don't think we recognize that, so you would have that sort of understanding as well. And, and again, think about that. If you conceive of it that way, you can see of it as much more episodic and sort of an adverse effect to those other drugs and, and not putting you on a path to lifelong chronic mental illness and, and have that designation placed on you. Bob, now I know, that, I know that a lot of your work has really been focused on trying to get the this, this science to look at its own science, that you're you know unearthing these studies that are really kind of pushed aside and and not and not acknowledged. And I think that's a really valuable and important um, perspective. But what about the research that really hasn't been done as much as it needs to be done? And I'm thinking specifically because I, I know so many people, and we've done a number of shows um, of people who have had really great um, results from using holistic health. They're using um, supplements. They're using herbs. They may be do- going to an acupuncturist or a naturopathic doctor. They're changing their diet. And all of these things seem to often play a really good role in helping people's wellness and recovery, but it's not something that's being researched enough. So what are your thoughts about how holistic health care fits into the kinds of changes that you'd like to see in the healthcare care system as a whole for, for mental health? Well, you know, I think we should be doing such research. And again, it, it, it starts from the sense that whatever we're doing now is not really working, right? I mean, again, from a societal point of view, to have this increase in the number of people on SSI, SSDI isn't good because, you know, it's a huge expense. So I would think we would want to put money into, uh, you know, whatever it might be, the benefits of yoga, the benefits of uh, herbal supplements, whatever, whatever you want to, you know, and I think also it might be interesting if you could see, if you could let those who have, you know, are in this situation of trying to cope with mental symptoms, right, or distressful symptoms, if it, to lead you to what should be researched, if that makes sense. So, for example, you say you know many people who are being helped by, let's say, yoga. Well, and I don't doubt that that's true. Well, that already is some feedback that tells you, aha, this is something we should be investigating. And, you know, I do think it's, I mean, in a way, do you need to quantify that? Do you need to put the society's stamp of approval on that? Well, in a way, you don't because people seek it out on their own. However, if you did such a study, then it it can be, and let's say it shows that, whatever, let's say depressed people who go into a yoga um, class and and, and do it regularly have better outcomes than those who don't, okay? Um, Well, now you can have more of a sort of a recommendation. This is something that can help people in that situation, and it can become, in essence, a form of, uh, a standard of care, a recommended standard of care by doctors, whoever you're seeing, etc. And I will say this too, if you put a societal stamp on something, it does sort of enhance the placebo effect, so to speak. It, yeah, exactly. If you get people to believe that it can help, in fact, it often will help. Sometimes just having a doctor recommend it rather than your friend or your partner or someone in your family makes a huge difference because it gives it that, that stamp of legitimacy and authority, like you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So my my answer to you is that, yeah, of course we should be doing this because what we're doing is not working. And, and you know, one interesting thing is if you look at how people vote, so to speak, <laughs> with their, their decisions, so many people are voting to do alternatives, right? Some take the drugs, their psychiatric drugs, and some do not. But you see so many people searching out alternatives, whether it be meditation, yoga, um, you know, all sorts of different alternatives. And that tells you that uh, the sort of narrow paradigm of care that we offer when you go to your psychiatrist or your hospital, it's just not enough. So the idea isn't that, say, a study is going to prove that yoga is the cure for schizophrenia or bipolar or depression. It's just that, well, there's a significant number of people who respond positively, so maybe we ought to actually be offering this to people with the sort of society seal of approval and the research behind it and the doctor's um, legitimacy. 
Um, Bob, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm interested in how the U.S. compares with other countries, because I know that you've looked at some of the European countries that are doing a much better job in actually helping people. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I have to say I'm not so sure about this anymore, <laughs> as societal-wide, um, because you're seeing rising disability rates like in England, Australia, in Canada, et cetera. You know, these are all English-speaking countries that have, in fact, embraced antidepressants, uh, you know, the modern psychiatric drugs. They, they, you know, they certainly have a psychiatric establishment that has embraced the, embraced the standard of care. What I really, th I, I, two things. However, I know Britain, for example, is starting to move away from the idea that you should use psychiatric drugs or antidepressants with kids. Britain is, I know, at some sort of uh, top level embracing the idea that exercise uh, should be sort of more incorporated into the paradigm of care for uh, depressed people. And then I think beyond that, and I'm just really trying to uh, identify these programs is you see pockets of programs uh, in, in, in European countries that are producing very good results. And the most notable example of this is the one I've talked about before is, is a group of doctors in Finland who decided some time ago that with their newly psychotic patients they should try to avoid putting them on antipsychotics and then they, if possible, get them through that episode without ever that exposure to drugs. And the idea is if you do that, the drugs don't cause these uh, brain change, changes that make them so vulnerable to relapse. And those people, it's a group of, of, of doctors, have reported very good five-year results. So, for example, there's this guy named Sekula in uh, Finland, and his five-year results are something like this. At the end of five years, only 14% of his psychotic patients are on neuroleptic drugs, and only 27% of his patients have ever been exposed to a single dose of drugs, and yet um, only 14% of his patients are chronically ill. The 86% are in some stage of either full recovery or moving towards recovery and doing and doing well. I mean, his outcomes are markedly better than ours. People going back to work, etc. So you would think that we would borrow from them, and that's actually one of the things I, I hope to do in this book is identify programs. Uh, both here in the United States and abroad, that are producing good results that are alternatives to our uh, normal standard of care. Um, are you optimistic about the future um, for the situation in the U.S.? Um, yes and no. Yes, because I don't, th you know, as, you, as we all know, the country's really struggling economically and we're running these huge deficits. Well, I, I think at some point we're going to be saying we just can't have all these people going on disability for mental disorders. We can't afford it. And because once people go on, they tend not to get off that SSI or SSDI. So I think once that financial recognition ha happens, we as a country will start saying, well, how do we get people well? Because this isn't working. How do we get people back to work and, 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 and transform mental illness back into more of an episodic thing as opposed to a, a permanent chronic condition? So in that way, oddly enough, I think there may be some change coming down the pike. The no is, it's because it's 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 because we as a society in general remain firmly in this sort of grip of this belief that, um, you know, mental disorders are sort of chronic, they're biologically based. People need their drugs. You know, there may be a small group of people who need drugs, but it's small. Um, and that is just such a powerful belief system, sort of a religious belief system. Um, I don't know when that's going to break, especially, or how it's going to break. Um, that, that's where my pessimism comes from. Although I will say this, as more and more parents see their kids who are diagnosed grow up and then really not fare well when they're 19, 20, 21, and be struggling with physical problems, and and going straight on to SSI and SSDI, I think those parents' experience will lead to a bit of a revolt as well. So I think the revolt will be seeded by the experience of children who are being medicated in this way. Well, your work is really doing a tremendous job in um, helping change the society, and I want to thank you for once again joining us on the show. And you know, when you get your new book out, um, we'll definitely want to have you back or even sooner uh, Terrific.
Um, Bob, give us the, some contact information. People want to go to your website or get in touch with you. How would they do that? Yeah, it's easy for people to get in touch with me. They just have to go to madinamerica.com. That's all one word website-wise. So M-A-D-I-N-A-M-E-R-I-C-A.com. And you just click on contact the author, and you can find there my phone number or my email. And I'm very responsive, so it's really easy to contact me. Robert Whitaker, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Will, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. You've been listening to an interview with Robert Whitaker. He is a Pulitzer finalist and a winner of the George Polk Award. He's the author of Mad in America, Bad Science, Bad Medicine, and the Enduring Mistreatment of the Mentally Ill that was named by the American Library Association as one of the best history books of that year and was named by Discovery Magazine as one of the best science books of that year. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJ LPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health communities, freedom center.org and the Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, radio to help get us broadcast on a station near you or if you just want to share what's in your head contact radio at madnessradio.net